Take two, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. So let's talk about truth. It's about time, perspectival truth. How can scientific theories be true or wrong in this sort of view? Let's quickly recall the sort of basic, complex structure of the universe that's occurring in these sort of levels of organization. And not just the, the fundamental levels of organization are real, but all of them. They're populated by different entities that are interesting to study. And as, as you get further up here into the realm of biology and the social sciences, uh, the separation of these levels, the organization of the world becomes much less clean cut and simple than in those very small realms that physics is studying down here and chemistry. We've talked about this sort of idea at the very end of last lecture, that we need some sort of criterion to decide what, what sort of insight, what entity out there is real, what insight is trustworthy. We need, in other words, as Wimsat writes, Bill Wimsat, to secure the reliability of our conceptual structures. Otherwise, what we're saying becomes just opinion, becomes relative. And it's important that there cannot be any privileged level of organization. Entities at all kinds of levels of organizations are real. So the fundamental criterion for trustworthiness is not that you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, like in reductionism, but it's uh, what Wimsat calls robustness, the robustness of an idea, of a theory, of an entity, of a process. And the, this whole idea uh, of, of tackling uh, a complex universe with many levels is motivated by this simple insight that there should be more ways of interacting with a spouse than with a quark. You have entities that are at your own level. If you have a partner, that's the sort of entity you interact uh, with probably the most. If you have friends, why shouldn't you consider them real? I'm sitting at a table here. I consider this table real and not just a collection of atoms. I'm in my house. Again, it's much more important for me to deal with this entity house than with the particles that are completely abstract and irrelevant in my level of organization. The world we see, we live in, we respond to and act upon is too important, too central to our way of being to be dismissed. And this is what reductionism is based on. It says all these things are not real. What's real is just the underlying sort of chemistry, the underlying physics and nothing else. And we have to get rid of this idea because it's absurd and it's, it's, it's counter our own daily experience. So instead of adjusting the world to some theory, let's adjust it to our real world experiences and come up with a view of the world that fits that experience better. But how do we decide then what is true and what is not? What is trustworthy knowledge and what is not? And so Wimsat comes up with this criterion called robustness. And it's quite simple. I'll give you the definition as it is written uh, in his book. Wimsat says, things are robust if they are accessible, and that can be detectable, measurable, derivable, definable, producible, or anything like that in a variety of, and that's very important, independent ways. What, the, what does that mean? I'll give you a bunch of examples throughout the course, but let's just think about it. So robustness is something that may apply not just to things or ideas, but to properties, relations, proportions, propositions. So theories are made of uh, propositions, models, levels, and perspectives themselves. So you can have a robust perspective, the one that's not robust. I have to admit, the genetic perspective on biology is very robust, while some of the stuff I'm going to tell you uh, during this lecture is not. It's an exploration. But every perspective starts out being fragile and only grows into a robust uh, 
sort of idea later on. The second point to make is uh, robustness does not require experimental measurement. It's much more broadly defined. It can rely on observation, derivation, production. So you have to produce a certain phenomenon to make it um, robust. And, and this is very, very important, and it comes back to our first lecture. This criterion does not give certainty because nothing does. There are no magic bullets in science or anywhere else for that matter. So we're staying inside this fallibilist view of knowledge. No empirical knowledge is ever 100% certain. Okay, so we can be realists and fallibilists. That's no problem. Mimsak goes on to argue, and we've encountered this already, that limited beings like us cannot hope to have a complete explanation of reality. It's irrational to think that some monkeys descended from a tree can understand the universe in its entirety, just like that. And he calls this, as a beautiful name, the myth of Laplacian omniscience. Laplace, of course, was a French mathematician, and he imagined this demon that would be able to measure the state of the universe at a given moment, all the elements of the universe at a given moment, and would then be able to predict not only the future, but also post-stick the entire past of the universe. It was one of the strongest arguments for what we call determinism. And what Wimsat is saying here is this omniscient being, basically, if you think about it, it must be God. It cannot be a real being that is limited through its, um, by its capacities and its, its context. So it doesn't make sense to even dream this dream of Laplacian omniscience, that we have this view from nowhere in Geary's term, or the God side. Instead, our scientific theories serve to answer a given question or address a given problem. So we do science because we have a problem to solve. Think about the matter of prioritizing too. There is so much to know about the world. How do we make priorities? How do we choose our questions and the problems we want to work on? This is not a rational or scientific process itself. It comes from within, from the things we care about. How do we choose? Further, uh, so this, this sort of local problem solving, the uh, complexity scientist, famous complexity scientist, Herbert Simon, we'll have more to say about him in, in the future in this uh, uh, series, calls this satisficing. So our theories, they don't have to be 100% true, certain, cover everything. They just have to solve the problem that we have. So this is satisficing. Therefore, our scientific perspectives are not like algorithms that always yield the correct solution. So you cannot just follow a model or a law and apply it everywhere. But they're more like heuristics. Heuristics are algorithms that mo work most of the time, but not all of the time. And you have to know when they work and when they don't. The advantage of those heuristics is they take a lot less time to calculate than true algorithms that give you the correct solution 100% of the time. They require much less effort, but they only work under specific circumstances. So all the models, all the so-called laws we have in science are built to solve specific problems. And they are perspectives in that sense. Wingset comes up with, which is my favorite chapter title in his book. That chapter title is called false models as means to truer theories. So he says, all of the models, the models that, that we're using are like tools, we'll come back to that. Okay, they're always false. There's a famous quote by statistician George Box, he says, all models are false, but some of them are useful. So it's very similar here. Our models are false, and they fail in certain ways. And the cool thing is that what we do is we learn from those failures. This is a feature of our way of knowing, not a bug, that all our models are false is a good thing. Remember, 
we've had this already a couple of times. At the very beginning, I said, uh, when I talked about Nassim Taleb's uh, view of anti-fragility in the world. So anti-fragile systems are the ones that learn from errors. They get smarter over time. And this is a metaphor for evolution. Evolution is the most fundamental process that is anti-fragile, okay? Learning from errors. So we need to make errors to learn. If, if we have a perfect theory that never fails, we don't learn anything, okay? Also this, this argument, by Michael Polanyi, if you remember, that our unique perspective, this sort of tacit knowledge that we have, that we cannot even talk about, that is a unique connection we have to the universe. And it's a good thing that every one of us has a different connection, that we should take advantage of this instead of erasing these differences between our perspectives, which is, is madness, okay? But this is what we're doing, especially in biology. It's very sort of a Uniform, it's the North Korea of academia. It's sort of, you know, if you don't have a genetic mechanism in your paper, the reviewer will send it back and say, you don't have a mechanism. You know, explanations are only allowed at this one level. It's crazy, especially in a field that is so rich with so many different levels. But I digress. So the point here is that we learn from making errors. Again, Nietzsche said that. Uh, two lectures back, remember? He said, you have to have the sort of guts to fail, okay? And then to know, to own your failure. If you do that, if you remember that quote, then you learn something. So systematic bias in the errors our theories produce contains information about how they fail, okay? And this is really cool. Uh, Wimsett calls this the metabolism error. So we process this error uh, like our metabolism processes our food. Analyzing, metabolizing these errors, therefore, is our guide to new knowledge. So we need to take a step back and see where does the system fail. What we do nowadays in this crazy academic system that we've built is we need to produce, 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 produce more in the tradition of our field because the people who review our grants who review our papers are in our field and if we don't fit in, boom, you're dead and you don't get published, you don't get your grant, I can tell you that. And there's also uh, um, quantitative evidence for this. If you try to go beyond the current perspective, you get shot down. This is fatal, especially in a field where we have basically so much that is not yet known, so much of the complexity that we don't understand completely crazy. So we need to stop with that. And we need to take a step back, look at our perspectives, try to see where they fail. But how do we do that? It's often when you're stuck, when you're just looking for your keys under the cone of light, then it's difficult to see the limitations of the claims based on your own perspective. But again, so the problem is, we still have to come back to this question of truth. Right? Robustness is okay. So we have many different independent ways. I mean, let's, let's look at this whole thing, uh, the question of truth in, in perspectivism uh, from a different angle. The truth matters. So the, the reason, I'm very critical of sort of some ways of doing science here, but having scientific knowledge and understanding why it works better than other kinds of knowledge in many ways is crucial today. I've been advertising doubt, radical doubt, doubt everything. Try to probe the limitations of your perspective to get out of it. On the other hand, truth matters a lot. So here's a book that I started reading lately uh, by Immaculata de Melo, Martin and Kristen Intiman, The Fight Against Doubt. It's about how the public relates uh, to science and how there's a lot of anti science sentiment, anti-intellectual sentiment out in the general population. This is a real problem, okay? Science is our guide to better, to truer uh, knowledge about the world. Not true knowledge, 100% certainty is impossible. So how, so, so we have to sort of walk, balance is a balancing act, right? So we have to walk this tight line between um, not falling into hubris and saying, okay, I know, for fact, this is what's happening, and also not falling into relativism and saying, okay, scientific knowledge is just another way of knowing. I can also go 
take a trip on acid and have this magnificent revelation and come back and say, okay, this is how the world is. This doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? So we had WIMSAT's robustness criterion. We can also say, to come back um, to an argument that we had before, we can be very pragmatic and say, just like William James, American pragmatist philosopher of the 19th century, he says the true is only the expedient in the way of our thinking, just as the right is only the expedient in the way of our behaving. So to behave in the right way is just what you ought to do. So truth is just what scientific knowledge ought to be about. That doesn't have really, it doesn't, it's expedient. It works. How does it work? It doesn't really help. Or Ron Geary, remember? I gave you this quote uh, two lectures back. Geary's writing, that a method is good to the extent that it tends to select hypotheses with desirable characteristics, such as agreement with data or wide applicability over hypotheses that lack these characteristics. Okay, so but then it works somehow, right? But, but in what way does it work? We have to get a little better than, than this if we want to, uh, if we want to talk about scientific truth and how you can have different perspectives at the same time get in some way at reality. Um, in this way. And here I want to introduce um, the first female philosopher I'm showing this. I'm sorry uh, that there's so many men here. The humanities are usually better in their gender ratio, but, but philosophy is peculiar. There are a lot less female philosophers than male philosophers, and this is a problem. So if you know female or other um, philosophers from, from minorities, for example, or, or whatever, that contribute important you know, um, work to the topics I'm presented here, please write to me. I'm always looking for those. But Michaela uh, Massimi is hard to overlook. She's great. She has an ERC grant. Philosophers also get such grants. Um, and that is on the topic of perspectival realism and its relation to truth. And she's done some really interesting work on this. She's at the University of Edinburgh. And she says, just like in the spirit of uh, James, uh, William James before, she says, uh, realism is normative, okay? As scientists, we have to get things right. This is what we ought to do. This is what we should be doing. And so we have to think about what it is, what sort of perspective, what, what, con what content in our perspective, what sort of claims we make are getting things right. We can't just say, this is my point of view. So I'll try to do that during the rest of the semester. I'm not just trying to say, hey, this is how things are. I'm saying, this is my point of view, and this is why. So I have to justify it somehow. So to sum up perspectival realism, again, in a nutshell, very briefly, um, and I like this way of putting it. Uh, so McKenna says here, states of affairs about the world are perspective independent, while our scientific knowledge claims about these states are perspective dependent. Okay, so there, again, we, we sort of accept that there's a world out there, it's independent of our minds, but the knowledge claims that we can make about it are always dependent on our perspective. And so uh, Massimi de de defines uh, perspectival truth as tracking perspective independent states of affairs, but the conditions that make the claim true depend on your perspective. What does that mean? I want to give you an example. So let's take an example from my own uh, discipline, evolutionary developmental biology. It's one of the foundational principles of evolutionary developmental biology. It's been assigned, attributed to uh, a bunch of famous people. We don't quite know where it came from. Richard Goldschmidt, Walter Garstang, um, Gavin de Beer, and Conrad Hal Waddington, depending on who you read. I'll give it to you in a forum published by Order in 1989. If you're interested in this topic, read Ron Amundsen's wonderful book about the changing role in the, uh, of the embryo in evolutionary thought. We'll come back to this book over and over again. And the quote says, in order to achieve a modification in adult form, evolution must modify the embryological processes responsible for that form. Therefore, an understanding of evolution requires an understanding of development. Case closed. This is a claim, a scientific claim. And the funny thing is, it is fundamental and true for 
the discipline of Iwo Diwa, the perspective of, of evolutionary developmental biology. But it is false and actually irrelevant to population genetics because that perspective is based on the assumption that the outcome isn't really biased by the developmental process. So you can look just at distribution of variabilities and phenotypes, and of course, population distributions of genetic factors. You can correlate those two without knowing anything about development. So is development important for evolution or is it not? How can we, we track the truth value of this statement? Well, the thing is, I mean, the first perspective is not difficult because it, well, it is. It's sort of assuming, so this, this claim is not based on, is it based on evidence? Or is it just saying, look, it has to modify embryological processes. I don't know, it could modify metabolism, behavior. I don't know, I'm not sure. So, um, okay, but, so it's an assumption. It's based on assumptions in both cases. Okay, so actually comparing um, those two, you find out that population genetics doesn't have to deal with development because it just defined it away. It didn't actually solve the problem saying, okay, I can prove that development is important. It just says, again, I assume. So basically the first perspective says, I assume that development is important. The second perspective says, I assume it's not important. Okay, so none of those give us uh, sort of proof that it's important or not. That's one problem. But the other problem is that we can actually, we can reconstruct why it's not important in population genetics. It's because of the aim of population genetics being different. So population genetics starts at the, the genetic and the phenotypic variability in a population. And it tries to explain how selection works on that uh, variability that is a given and is supposed to be sort of random and not very much influenced by what's going on in development. Okay, so there's a rationalization why development is not important, but there's no sort of scientific substance to this argument at all. This is what I was calling a uh, bullshit argument before. We'll come back to bullshit arguments. So it's not a very good argument. Instead, we can look at those different perspectives and say, okay, we have to look at this in a different way. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a different take on why development is important for evolution in this lecture series, for example. So back to, to Michele Mas, uh, Massimi and, and truth uh, in perspective. She makes a really useful distinction and I want to end this lecture on this distinction. She says, there are two sort of contexts in which scientific claims have to be considered. One is the context of use, okay? So development by definition is important in evolutionary developmental biology. Right? So in, in this context of use, you can also justify, like the completeness uh, principle does, why it's important. But if you stay within that one perspective, it doesn't help you make a, a, a sort of any sort of statement. It, it, it's not sufficient to establish that this is a perspective of truth. For that, you have to consider a context of assessment. So basically, knowledge claims are sensitive to the context of use in other uh, perspectives, like like population genetics, development may not be um, important. And so uh, knowledge claims that can be assessed across perspectives are getting things right. Okay, and this is a case, this example, we weren't quite sure. We may be getting things right, but it's a first step. We can compare the role of development in both perspectives, and we can now look at the perspective sort of from the outside. We can step outside and get a God's eye view, but we can get a little bit of that by comparing perspectives and learning from the differences between perspectives. And that's very similar, but not quite the same as robustness or learning from a metabolism of errors. They complement each other, I think. I haven't really thought about this uh, deeply enough, but I think robustness sort of jibes with this. So it would say that the more perspectives you have that, that use a, a, a certain um, uh, process or entity 
the more robust it is as a piece of knowledge. Okay, but robustness doesn't say much about uh, cross perspective comparison. While the uh, learning from errors is one thing, but here you learn from differences between perspectives, which is slightly different. So what we need to proceed with this lecture is we need a disruptive strategy. So the way we are usually framing problems in biology is okay, but it's within this one perspective of genetic re redu uh, reductionism. Overwhelmingly, there's some signs in systems biology or tissue mechanics that we're stepping out of this paradigm, but there's still sort of margin. So we're still stuck in this one perspective. And so we need to step out of that perspective to disrupt our framing, to get to a new frame, so that we can have a diversity of perspectives again in biology and compare them and learn more about much, many, many more questions in biology than we can learn from this one reductionist genetic perspective alone. So what we're gonna do next, in the next module, we're gonna take everything apart, literally everything apart and look at it as a process. We're gonna look at the world and biology, organisms and evolution, but also the process of doing science in this sort of dynamic perspective. And that will hopefully demonstrate how you first of all can get a different perspective and how you can use it in a comparative way to learn more about the limitations of your own perspective. Tune in again very soon when we talk about process thinking. Thanks for watching. See you next time.